draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. He loves those who love him, and those who seek him diligently find him. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hopes set on the living God. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? Fight the good fight of faith. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run, that you may obtain it. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. For the one who endures to the end will be saved. What I wanted to talk about today was this notion of striving and persevering and enduring to enter the kingdom of heaven versus this idea of just resting in Christ, okay? Because there's two different gospels being presented here. One says that you need to strive to enter in through the narrow door and persevere and endure to the end. And the other says that you just need to to rest and that Christ paid it all. And that's all you need to do. So these are two diametrically opposed gospels. And there's verses that seem to say that, yes, we, we do need to strive. We need to press in. And then there's other verses that say uh, that we just need to rest. So how do we make these two mesh? This is what I'm going to go over today. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into it. As we can see, there's verse after verse. There's literally dozens of verses that say things like strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Strive for the holiness. We're commanded to strive for holiness, to draw near to God, to uh, you know, diligently seek him. Um, and to love them with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, and Paul uses words like struggling and toil and striving. Uh, fight the good fight of faith. This is what we're supposed to do. Um, he, he compares it to a race that we're running and that we need to press in as though only one can win the prize. And this is how we need to view things. Um, and, you know, that, that we need to run this race with endurance. Um, and also, uh, have endurance because the one who endures to the end will be saved. So I could go on and on. Uh, this isn't even all the verses, but we could, we could go on and on with this. Um, but there's also verses people would say that say that we just need to rest, that Christ paid it all. And we just need to rest in that, accept that. Um, and that's all we need to do. There, there isn't any striving or enduring that we need to do. Um, and a lot of people might be shocked that the Bible really doesn't have that many verses that say this. There's only about two or three verses that would seem to indicate that, that you just need to rest. So uh, let's go ahead and look at those. Um, here's the most popular when Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And uh, we'll say, see right there, we, we just need to rest. Uh, and then in Hebrews, it says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest 
for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore, but see, then this is what makes it confusing. The verse right after that says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And then, of course, we have 1 John 5 that says his commandments are not burdensome. Um, so there shouldn't be any striving or struggling or anything like that if his commandments are, are easy and they're not burdensome, right? Um, but this is, this is, for the most part, um, this is it. Just, just these couple of verses right here. And what I wanted to do today is to look at this one verse um, right here. And this is, this is kind of a peculiar verse, and it doesn't really seem to make much sense just if you look at it um, just right off the bat. It says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, when I first came across this, I was thinking, what in the world does this mean, the violent take it by force? I mean, because we're not supposed to be violent. We're not supposed to be really taking anything by force, uh, let alone he's saying that, that we need to take that, the kingdom of heaven violently by force. And it, it, it took me a while um, it took me a while to get this. I, I prayed for, for guidance, for the Holy Spirit to reveal this to me. And it's actually much simpler than, than most people might think. Uh, it's just looking at it at face value. It means just that. It means that we need to have this sort of violent mindset towards inheriting the kingdom and in such a way that we are taking it by force, that we're running this race in such a way that we are going to stop at nothing to take a hold of life, right? That we're going to take the kingdom of heaven uh, violently with, with vigor, and it's not just me that says this. If we just look back at the early Christians, um, they have the exact same view on this. And this is very interesting, uh, what I came across. Irenaeus says this. He says, the Lord declared, and this is about this verse. He says, the Lord declared that the kingdom of heaven was the portion of the violent. He says, the violent take it by force. By the violent, he means those who by strength and earnest striving are on the watch to snatch it away on the moment. This able wrestler, therefore, exhorts us to enter the struggle for immortality. He does this so that we may be crowned and so that we may deem the crown precious, for it is that which is acquired by our struggle. Since then, this power has been conferred upon us. The Lord has taught and the apostle has commanded us even more to love God so that we may reach this ourselves by striving after it. So they took it to mean just that, that we need to violently take hold of life in order to receive the crown. And uh, we do this by loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? And we do this by striving to live right. Uh, and it's not just Irenaeus. If we also look at Clement of Alexandria, he says this about this verse. The violent who storm the kingdom are not persons who are argumentative in speeches. Rather, they are said to take it by force because they continue in a right life and in unceasing prayers. They thereby wipe away the blots left by their previous sins. He says the kingdom belongs preeminently to the violent. They reap this fruit from investigation, study, and discipline so that they may become kings. This sounds a lot like seeking God with all, loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he goes on to say, the kingdom of heaven does not belong to sleepers and sluggards. Listen to that. Rather, the violent take it by force. For this alone is commendable violence, to struggle with God and to take life from God by force. And he knows those who persevere firmly, or rather violently, and he yields and grants, for God delights in being conquered in such things. Uh, and lastly, we have Tertullian. He says, offering up prayer to God, as with united force, we wrestle with him in our supplications, 
God delights in this violence. So they believed uh, they believed it meant just that, that you, you are to take hold of life and take it violently and stop at nothing uh, and toil and strive to, to do this. Um, but let's not just take their words on it because their, their words are not inspired. You know, we, we know that. Th these are not uh, words of inspired apostles. But these were uh, early Christians, and this is what the early Christians thought that were uh, basically right under the apostles or, you know, just a generation or two removed from the apostles. So they would have been under their teaching. But um, let's just look. This lines up perfectly with what we see Jesus teaching. If we just look in Revelation uh, chapters 2 and 3 and really all throughout Revelation, we see he says to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. Now, this is salvation, and he's saying that there's a condition to eating of the tree of life, and that's to conquer. And over and over again, if you just look throughout Revelation, he says, to the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. This is salvation. He goes on to say, the one who conquers over and over and over again. But now let's just pause right here, because some people will say that to conquer just means simply to have faith. They, they swap this word out conquer and they replace it with faith and they say see it, it just means that we need to have faith that, that's all we need to do and they use this verse right here they go back to first john 5 and uh to make it even more confusing this is right after the verse about uh, his commandments not being burdensome okay uh, if we just look at verse 4 he says for everyone who has been born of god overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So he's saying this is how we conquer is through our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So they say, see, uh, to overcome just means simply to have faith. And therefore, we can look at Revelation and just replace conquer with the word faith. But guys, this is, this is twisted. This is taking a Greek word that means something totally different than faith and simply just swapping it out because you see that uh, in, in this in 1 John 5 that we overcome through our faith. And yes, we do overcome through our faith, but that's an active and obedient faith, right? If we just look in James 2 and other parts of the Bible, we see that this is an active and obedient faith. But either way, they're swapping this word out and getting away with it. They're, they're literally taking away from Revelation, which it says that, uh, that your share will be taken away if you take out of the out of the book of Revelation uh, or add to the words. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're they're replacing the word conquer with faith. But guys, if we just look at at at, at all these uh, at all these exhortations to conquer, we can see that this is not talking about faith. In fact, if we just look at Revelation two and three, Jesus over and over again is saying, I know your works. I see your works. He's talking about their deeds that they're doing. OK, not not their faith. He, he doesn't he doesn't mention I see your faith. I know your faith. Um, but if we just look at this uh, right here to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna and the white stone to the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end. To him, I will give the authority over the nations. See right there, he, he's talking about more than just more than just believing. He's talking about actually conquering. We got to be careful not to replace words. Um, to the one who conquers, we'll be clothed thus in white garments. And we know what, what garments are. Uh, in Revelation 19, 18, it says that fine linen as the righteous deeds of the saints. And a uh, very similar story in Zechariah chapter 3, um, where, where garments are referred to as, as the deeds. Uh, and it says, And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father. And his angels. This is talking about salvation. Uh, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and write on him the name of my, my God. And I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Listen to this. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So he's saying that we are to conquer in the same way that Jesus conquered. Now, how did Jesus conquer? Did he conquer simply by believing that God existed and that's it? No, he, he conquered by going to the cross, actually doing what he was commanded to do, doing everything that he was commanded to do. And this is the call in our life as well. He, he says it right here. 
to the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered. Um, right here in Revelation 12. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And see, most people stop there and they say, see, we, we conquer by the blood of the lamb. We, we just need to believe in Jesus, plead the blood of Jesus, and that's how we conquer. But, they, but a lot of people don't read on. It says, for they loved not their lives even unto death. This is talking about how they, you know, these people have renounced the world. They don't go back into the world. They don't go back into sin. They, they don't love their lives. They love God more. They love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. They're pressing in. They're not going back to the world. Like, like in 1 John says, uh, you know, if you go back to the world, you're, you're not going to make it. Okay. You, you make yourself an enemy of God. Uh, then it says, Revelation uh, 21, to the one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. And listen to this contrast right here. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. See, this is contrasting people's deeds to the one who conquers. Well, conquers what? Well, it's talking about sin because it compares it to the contrast here, which is the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the idolaters. So, so it's making a clear distinction that, that you are to conquer the world. We do it through Jesus, but we're to conquer the world. We're to conquer our sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and it says, but as for the cowardly, those, those who are cowardly will, will not make it into the kingdom. Um, now, so, so how do we, how do we make these two mesh? How do we make these two ideas mesh? Well, I think that the answer is found right here and, and in other places as well, but this, this sums it up pretty well. Paul says, for this, I toil struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Now this, I think is the key. This is the answer. Paul says that he toiled. Paul says that he struggled. Paul, um, Paul had this striving. He said that we're to run this race, right? But he did it with the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is exactly the call on our lives as well. That, you know, like we can do all things through, through him who strengthens us, right? Uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to conquer. We are able to conquer our sin. We are able to flee uh, the passions of uh, of this world, passions of lust. Okay, um, and and this is very clear. And and what people try to do is they try to say, well, since God's standards are so high, He never intended for us to actually do them. So He just said, you know what? Uh, let's just forget about it. Um, I, I'm just going to save you anyways, even though you're you're a wretched sinner. You're going to remain a wretched sinner. But see, that's not that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible doesn't just disregard his holiness and forget it. No, no. We're called to be conquerors, okay? But we conquer through his spirit. It's so much more beautiful of a story that he doesn't disregard his holiness, that he still keeps his standard of holiness. But instead of letting us wallow in our sin, that he actually sent his son to die on the cross and rose again and filled us with his spirit. He said that he was going to send us the helper, he said that he was going to send us the, the, the counselor who was going to guide us into truth. Okay. And, and he's going to guide us into holiness. This is so much more beautiful of a story um, than that we just need to rest and, and just rest in our sin. No, he, he's, he's going to help us. And we, we have to look at it like this. Th this is how we make all these verses about striving and toiling and struggling mesh with the verses that talk about rest. Okay. Picture it like this. Picture it like, um, like we need to uh, climb Mount Everest. He says, I want you to climb Mount Everest. Okay, he, he's, he's not going to disregard that command. We need to climb Mount Everest. And you can look at him and say, well, that's impossible. I can't do that. I, I've never even climbed a mountain before. I don't know how to do that. And I would die. There's, it's impossible. There's no way. But see, with God, all things are possible, right? So he calls us to the impossible. He called Peter out into the water to do the impossible. That's what we're called. Healing people, that's impossible. 
Okay, but we're called to do that as well. We're called to live supernatural lives, right? We're called to, to, to do the impossible. And, and this is what people don't get. They, they underestimate God. They underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, for in, in, all, in all areas of our lives, not just in healing and prophecy and all that, but also uh, in living holy lives. They underestimate his power. So, um, but, but he says, I want you to, cl to climb Mount Everest, okay? And you say, it's impossible. And he says, no, it's not. Why? Because I'm going to equip you. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to give you the experience that you need. I'll give you whatever you need. If you need uh, tracking poles, if you need boots, if you need an ice axe to get up those, uh, you know, those icy mountain areas, if you need oxygen, you know, whatever you need to make the trek up Mount Everest. Um, I read somewhere that it takes about two months to, to scale Mount Everest. Um, but see, the thing is, is that he is there with us every step of the way. Yes, he calls us to the impossible. Yes, he calls us to be perfect as he is perfect. Okay, that, that, that's like climbing Mount Everest. That, that, that's an impossible feat to do on our own, right? Um, you know, especially without any equipment or training or anything like that. But see, he's a good father. He, he came down and gave us his Holy Spirit so that we can be equipped. That He, he says, you know, that, that he'll give us whatever he needs. He'll help us along the way. He's a good father. He's going to give us the equipment that we need, the training that we need in order to be, be able to carry out his commands. He didn't just give us these commands to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength because he knew we couldn't do it. And that he was just going to, uh, you know, die in our place and just say, I ah, forget it. You don't have to do that. No. We're, we're called to be perfect. That, that's the call, okay? But, but he's going to get us there. We just have to continue to have faith in him and to take that next step. This is where the struggling comes in. Now, if, if we just look at him and say, um, you know, well, yeah, 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 I believe that you can get me up that mountain, but then don't take the actions that you need to. You're not struggling to get up that mountain. You're still going to have to struggle, even if he says that he's going to help you and provide you every single thing that you need. And, and if, let's say, an animal comes up and tries to attack you, he's going to be there to defend you and make sure you have every single thing you need to do it. That still doesn't mean that you're not going to have toiling and struggling, and it's going to be extremely difficult, even with all that help, to get up there because he's not just going to pick you up and just take you without, you know, against your will. And if you're not willing to go up there, no, we, we cooperate with him in the process. We're the one that takes that first step. Okay. We, we don't just sit back and say, no, it's impossible. I can't do it. No, no. We take that first step. We, we take the second step and the third, and we keep walking with him and we keep listening to him on, on the, the right path to get up the mountain. Okay. Don't, don't go over here. This is dangerous. Go over here. He, he's our guide. He guides us to the promised land, right? And this is what people miss. So, uh, just closing thoughts. Are you taking the kingdom of heaven violently? Are, are, do you have this stubborn mentality that you're going to enter the kingdom of God no matter what it takes? You're going to press in to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you're going to stop at nothing. You're not going to let anybody stop you. You're not going to let the devil stop you. You're not going to let people stop you, the world stop you, and that you can do this with the power of the Holy Spirit. That you can do all things, right? Do you have this mentality that you're going to press in and that you're going to stop at absolutely nothing? You're going to be violent. You know, when, when we talk about people being violent, it's that they have this determination that they're going to do something no matter what the cost, right? This is exactly the mentality that we need to have with God that we're going to press in no matter what the cost. If he asks us to renounce everything, then that's what we're going to do. If he asks us to give something up, then that's what we're going to do. If he asks us to, to help this person out, to give, uh, you know, to give this amount of money away, then, then that's what we're going to do. Okay, we're, we're going to press in to lay hold of eternal life. We're, we're not going to stop at anything. We're going to run this race with endurance and we're going to press in. We're going to strive. So this way we don't need to, to get rid of all these verses that talk about striving, um, striving for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Okay. That's exactly what we need to be doing. We need to be striving. But again, we do it in, in the peace and the power of the Holy Spirit. So all these, all these verses that talk about rest, 
they're talking about this, um, th this internal rest. Um, they're talking about this peace that you have uh, as God powerfully works in you. You still have this joy and this peace, even though it's hard. And even though you're, you're pressing in and you're struggling, you still have this peace. And God, the comforter, the Holy Spirit is there with you. And he's helping you every step of the way. He's guiding you. And, um, and, and this is why it says his commandments aren't burdensome. Because he, he, he's going to take you each step of the way. He's going to say, okay, now, now do this. Okay, you, you can do it. He's rooting us on. He's for you, not against you, right? And he's rooting you on the whole time saying, okay, now, now take this step. Come on. Come on, you, you can do it. You can get up this mountain. Let's go. Let's go. And, and he's guiding you up here. Now, that's that's just such a beautiful story. Um, so, so yes, uh, we, th there's a toil, there's a struggle, there's endurance that's needed. Um, but at the same time, we have rest in the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have joy. We have peace. We have all that while we're, we're struggling uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's all I got for today. God bless.